Hey everybody, welcome to The Lawyer's Daughter. I have such a special show today and I'm so excited to bring these guests to you. It is a show that I think will speak to many of you, speak to your heart, speak to the trauma that you've endured and then provide a way for you actually to pay it forward, which I know so many of you are interested in doing. This is a cause I can get behind. But I wanted to tell you the story really quick of how I met these beautiful people. Um, a while back when I was working on the Life Coach Pod, I was doing a show about grief and how grief is very different during COVID because you can't go be with the people that you want to be with. I've lost some folks. We can't have funerals. It's just been, it's been awful that we haven't had a way to process that grief in the same way. Well, unfortunately, and yet fortunately, in the process of that, a guest of mine happened to use some information from this group that I'm bringing today, that I'm introducing to you today, called Opus Peace. And the president of the organization called me and mentioned the copyright violation. And if you know me, that's just like not okay. I'm in marketing and I try super hard to not make those mistakes, but I didn't understand the source of the material. So I apologized and out of that grew an acquaintanceship that led to today's interview. And I am very pleased to introduce two incredible women from the Opus Peace Organization. Deborah, and I can't believe I forgot your last name. I was so excited talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> all the better, all the better. My last name is Grassman. Grassman, that's right. I had it written down, but I forgot. And then we have Marie Bainbridge, and they both have interesting stories about this organization, but I wanted to screen share just a quick minute because I think this will get the attention of the folks that are listening, is that this is the mission of the organization to liberate unmourned loss, hurt and unforgiven guilt and shame. And if you don't think that speaks to what we often talk about, even as part of this podcast. Um, you've missed the point because that's exactly where we have been. And I'm going to show you also that there, the website has this beautiful, beautiful, I'm trying to get things out of the way so you can make sure you see it. This is the website for Opus Peace, but there is this incredibly beautiful sculpture that's a photograph here on the page. And I think for all of us who've dealt with trauma can relate to how this sculpture feels, what it's conveying, that, that hole, that missing center that you feel when you're dealing with trauma and when you're trying to recover. And we'll talk about soul injury, but I wanted to just give you the visuals to help connect it to the mm -hmm. conversation we're going to have, because it's pretty incredible. And um, Deborah is now the one of the founders of the organization, as is Marie. And Marie comes to us from, from, being, from the war. She's a Vietnam vet. Is that correct, Marie? Do I have that right? That's, that's correct. Yes, and yes. she has lived with PTSD. And I'll tell you, she's lived with it at a time when it first started to even become a thing, like before mm -hmm. the letters were really there and we didn't know what right. to call it, which is, of course, some of our struggle as a, as a culture as we came out of the Vietnam War and not understanding. We as citizens had to accept responsibility for not treating our soldiers properly when they came home. And I know the soldiers came home and felt rejected on top of everything else they had endured. Mm -hmm. And so I welcome both of you and I would, and, and we have for you and as part of this discussion today, a training we're gonna talk about that you can participate in that could be life-changing. And it certainly aligns with everything that we value and with regard to healing and trauma. So Deborah, I'd love to hear about the organization and then also Marie, your story. So I'm, I'm essentially going to turn it over to you right now. Tell me. <laughs> well, Opus Peace was founded by five of us VA hospice nurses, uh, two of us here, three others. We work, I worked for 30 years for the VA doing hospice work as a nurse practitioner. Uh, Marie was our charge nurse on our inpatient unit. And over those 30 years, we took care of more than 10,000 dying veterans. And I will tell you that people who've been traumatized, number one, know things that non-traumatized people do not know. And I will also tell you that dying people know things that the rest of us who aren't actively dying uh, know. So what I will tell you is that we learned lessons. I mean, we had these incredible lessons as we sat at the bedsides of these dying veterans. And what they really taught us is what you already said. They taught us 
how to liberate unmourned loss and hurt because they had pretty much been taught in the military, don't mourn, don't grieve. You're weak if you grieve. So the result of that kind of teachings impacted them. And then of course they come to the end of their lives and those layers start getting peeled off little by little. And what you, what we often saw was this kind of sometimes a stoic hardened crust. But when you peel back that stoic hardened crust, what was there was a peace seeking person. And many had already learned that lesson, so to speak, way before they ever came to us in hospice. Some had not discovered it yet. And as they came to hospice and they're faced with this, that started the layers coming off. Because it's pretty hard to stay in denial. Oh, I'm not sad. Oh, this doesn't hurt. Oh, I don't have any losses. When in fact, when you're dying, I mean, everything's a loss. You have to let go of everything you know and love and are familiar with, including your own body. Right, right. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing, which I think is so relevant, and that is unforgiven guilt and shame. Because you can appreciate that when someone's getting ready to meet their maker the next day, the next week, the next year, whatever it may be, they start thinking about things differently. They start reviewing their lives. And often you just see this wisdom. I'm not talking about just life experience, sir. I'm talking about wisdom. You know, wisdom comes from a different place, way, yeah. way down here. It doesn't just come from here. It does just come from even here. It comes from deep down, from the soul, what I would call the soul, that deepest part of self. So that's often what we would see at the end of life. Uh, we would see people, as we all do as we're dying, looking back over our lives, maybe expressing regrets taking responsibility for those regrets and reaching out to ask for forgiveness. And, you know, we often witnessed people receiving forgiveness and that kind of healing that often occurs. And so that was the advantage, this privileged vantage point of being doing hospice work for years, years with traumatized people, um, gave us a special vantage point, I think, uh, even that's beyond the average hospice worker, is because we dealt with so much trauma in addition. And even trauma pe people, I mean, there's thousands of PTSD specialists and trauma specialists, mm -hmm. but they haven't seen how trauma morphs at the end of life. See, there's very few people that have had that vantage point of seeing dying traumatized people. And I think that's kind of the confluence of both of those patient populations, the dying and trauma. The convergence of both of those populations is what's yielding what we now know about soul injury. And so the legacy that we want to bring to the world through Opus Peace is the lessons that those dying veterans taught us and would want us to teach their fellow comrades, because veterans who are not dying don't necessarily know that vantage point. And certainly this applies to anybody that's been traumatized. And it applies to every single one of us, mm -hmm. um, it, to the average public, because we all at certain times become separated from our own sense of self. We forget who we really are. And that's our definition of a soul injury is when we become separated from our real self. We become separated from who we are meant to be, who we want to be. And that's what we really learned. At oh, the Deborah, point, that, if, if, there's, better. if there's nothing I have heard more often from the victims of sexual assault or anyone who's been through trauma, but it's that they aren't who they used to be. Mm -hmm. That is, that is the, the great, in fact, I was just speaking with someone this morning who's just had a child and she's so worried she's going to bring all the trauma to her child sure. and that idea. And I know I've changed in the last two years. So I understand what you're talking about. And it's, it is a horrible feeling that you feel like you're so changed and so different. I think one of the problems too, that compounds that 
you know, we all know that when you've been through trauma, you are forever changed. You can, you know, you'll never be the same. And we all know that. But in our heart, we yearn to go back to the way it used to be. And, and the person, our loved one that was traumatized, we want them to go back mm -hmm. to the way they used to be. And so one of the things I teach people is before you do any healing work at all, your first job is to grieve the loss of the person you used to be. That person is no longer. And if you don't grieve that person, you're going to always be disappointed that you didn't go, that you can't go back. You're going to um, feel guilty, feel like you're letting others down because you, because they want you to go back too. They want you to go back. That, that is that go your family. family. Yes. So I tell family members of trauma victims, I would say, you know, the first thing you have to do is grieve the loss of the person you used to know. That person, she or he is not going to be the same. And in little ways, consciously or unconsciously, you're, if you're wanting them to go back, you're going to be sending signals to them. Oh, go back to the way you mm -hmm. used to be. Even if you don't realize it, even if it's not overt. But if you will grieve the loss of that person, that allows you to let go of what was and open up to what is. And you can't deny, you have to stop denying that this thing, whatever it was, whatever the form of trauma it was, occurred. It happened. Don't try to pretend it didn't happen. Don't try to push it in the back. Don't say, oh, well, that was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. You know, it's on the playing field. It has energy. And you have to learn how to develop a different relationship with that part of self that has sustained that. And you have to learn how to connect with it and extend self-compassion to that part of self. So pretending like, oh, it didn't happen, and I know that's over, and we're just going to keep getting on with things, and I'm just going to keep marching on. Um, I mean, th that kind of stoic strength is important. I'm not saying it's not. Don't get me wrong, because we all have jobs, and we have to put one foot in front of the other, and that can be really uh, important. Uh, and it's also important to be able to let that facade, that stoic facade down, to be able to validate the suffering that has occurred. So Marie, this is, so we, we talk, we, I know what you've, you've been, I haven't heard your story, but I, I know that you came back from war. I can't even imagine. I mean, just that enough for me, it feels traumatizing, but <laughs> what, tell me, how is it, you, you were doing this work, but how has it been for you personally? How have you healed or, or worked to heal yourself? Well, I think it's helped since working with Deborah, tell you the truth. I married a Vietnam vet. I met him at Walter Reed. He was coming back from Vietnam and I was going to Vietnam. And after we got married, we went to support group and I was barred from coming in. They said, this is only for men. So, you know, after that, I, I never did try. Um, but I think working on the hospice unit, I think that's the thing that helped me heal the most because I had great credibility with these veterans since I was a Vietnam vet and through their healing, I think it helped me heal. And plus there's no, with Opus Peace, it's honesty, courage, and humility. This is what we live. Um, so there's no pushing back. It is seeing what's in front of us and going through the process, not denying it. Don't even know I am lying is denial. And we, we, we don't believe in that. So honesty, <laughs> courage, and humility. Humility, yes. That's, that's, those, are, those are very powerful fundamentals. It's it is. absolutely something I believe in, but I think it's, it's tough because we, as a culture, we don't tend to necessarily reward those things, mm -hmm. especially humility. And, and I know you, and, and shame, shame is so big whether you know you, we none of us are did you, you've been traumatized the shame isn't yours and yet somehow mm -hmm. we managed to shift that in our culture to somehow <laughs> indicate you're not strong or weak mm -hmm. i think shame is the most reflective of a soul injury because if you think about shame it's being afraid of who we are or who we are not mm -hmm. you know and 
that's the core of a soul injury is, you know, being afraid of, of who we are, not knowing who we are, being separated from who we really are. So shame is that barrier. One of the things that we, our premise is, we already have everything we need in order to be whole. It's not about putting more in, trying to be stronger and be more resilient. It's not that. It's that there are barriers that prevent access to that wholeness that's already there. Well, what are those barriers? Well, you open the show with by yeah. saying it. Unmourned loss and hurt and unforgiven guilt and shame. So you, you will see that our approach is different. We're not going to try to convince you, oh, you're strong. You can handle anything. You can do anything. Our contention is that's in there. You are a survivor. You've gotten as far as you have because of that. But what if we removed the barriers? What if we taught you a process for learning how to connect with the part of self that is holding that pain and that hurt and how to release that so that you are more completely inhabiting yourself? And fundamentally, it is about not being afraid of pain. We are fundamentally, as a culture, fearful of emotional pain. I mean, you look at all the numbing agents, and I'm not talking about uh -huh. those alcohol and drugs or mm -hmm. shopping or internet. I mean, there are lots of ways to numb out. And our society and our culture, it is all about feel good. And not only feel good, but feel good now, quickly. You know, there's no, you know, no delayed gratification. It's 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 now. So our program hand approaches things a bit differently. And in many ways, when you can't change what has happened, it's learning to make peace with that pain, changing the relationship. Instead of trying to hide from it and pretend it didn't happen, I'm just going to go on as if it didn't happen. It's opening up and acknowledging and being willing to, to be in the truth of that and walk with that. And there's some very simple things that can be done that, that help us learn how to stay grounded, stay in our own truth, and be able to allow pain and peace to sit side by side together. You know, I got, I got a goose flesh when you said, I hope this sounds okay, I'm hearing a little bit of raspiness, but I, I got goose flesh when you said that it's in us already like we we're already okay like the, the who we are right in this moment is good and what's what may be in our way is the thing are those things that are holding us mm -hmm. back the unmourned loss and the shame so, and so i think that's such an important message because i think we forget we do we are trained to go and look for it and seek it and to think there's a pill or a something mm -hmm. or I mean, I went through a really dark period this last weekend, and my number one rule for myself was that I was not going to take any extra medication. I take an antidepressant, but I wasn't going to do anything else. No, no drinking, no nothing. I was just going to sit with it as mm -hmm. awful as it was, Good. and it was awful, but I just realized I needed to make my world small, and I needed to just sit with it, and then I can't explain why, but yesterday I woke up, and I thought, I, I can do this again. Like, I'm back. I don't know how it worked, but for four days I was down hard. And and I normally, I, I normally used to have a kid around, so I don't have a child around anymore, but normally I would never have made space for that. Never in the whole world. I mean, I disappeared off social media. I basically just disappeared for four days. And a couple people knew, and I made sure my mom and daughter knew I was okay, but I just needed to be <laughs> dark and in pain. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is a, that's a big deal. I mean, I did, I felt a little guilty for taking that space, right? I mean, just, it's unusual. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's powerful to know that just who you are is enough and you're there and it's good. Now let's get to the part that's, that's preventing you from moving forward. Mm -hmm. So what you just told me is that if you've not done this before, and I don't know if you have, but it sounds to me like what you did was, um, a step forward, I, I guess, is, or a step inward, a, a step yeah. deeper, in, in that uh, you're less, somehow, something's happened where you are now less a fearful, you're less fearful of your own mm -hmm. emotional pain, you're more willing to be with what is, and to give it presence, to give it attention, and when you do that, what you did was you did it consciously, mm -hmm. you had intention, as opposed, because there's a lot of ways to disappear, 
you said disappearing as in you didn't go on social media. You could have just as easily disappeared by going on social media in a flurry and really doing all this stuff, you know, social media. And no one would have guessed that that was really a numbing agent, essentially, of being not present to yourself, of disappearing from your own self by appearing in all the social media and doing all this kind of stuff. So um, a lot of times when I talk about numbing agents, it's, you know, one of the things that I do, I, I also have suffered a bit from PTSD. And one of the things I would do initially when I was first dealing with it, when I would get, when I would disappear, when I'd be triggered, when something would happen, I'd be triggered, and then I'd just kind of disappear from myself, and I would get on my bicycle, and I would just ride, and I'm, I'm telling you, I could ride really fast when I was triggered, you know, um, and then it occurred to me that I was simply disappearing, so then I still did exercise, so I still would get, when I'm triggered, I still will get on my bicycle and get on the bike trail, but I now say to myself every time I'm pedaling, I'm come back home to yourself, Deborah. come back home. Yes, this did hurt. Yes, this did hurt. You know, it was just a trigger. It didn't really happen. You know, it's just triggering the, the past, but feel your pain, feel your pain. So you can go on social media as a way of disappearing, or you can go on it as a way of connecting. You can get on your bicycle and ride as a way of disappearing or as a way of disconnecting. It all depends on the relationship you have with whatever you're using to try to integrate rather than compartmentalize and separate and segregate. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes so much sense. And I talk about intention a lot because I think that it, it said, being aware, number one, conscious of your feeling and conscious of how you're doing and then setting an intention or, and, and I did, I intentionally made time. I, I, I've never really done anything like that before, but I just, it seemed like I just needed to do it. I, I don't know that I could have done anything else to be perfectly honest, but that idea that those two things I think are some of the most powerful keys to unlock progress is to be aware of what you're feeling and then to be intentional about how you want to deal with it. And I love that you just brought that up and talked about it because I don't know how else as human beings we can manage ourselves if we can't master those two abilities. Those to me seem core and we so don't. I want taught. you to hold on, put your hand. Jennifer, put your hand you back where it. you did. You, you did, did something. You, you did, did something it. that we teach. We call this the anchoring heart technique. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what my guest was talking about, the anchoring heart technique. Which There mm -hmm. you go. So That's let's right. talk about that just for a minute because when you're feeling un uncomfortable feelings, and you often that is emotional pain, but you could also be uncomfortable with your own beauty and your own light and your own inner goodness. A lot of people are afraid of their own light. It's not just being afraid of your shadow, it's also being afraid of your light. But at any rate, my point is whenever you're feeling any uncomfortable feeling, to be able to grasp your heart. Because think about it, if, you, if I gave you bad news right now, and I know your story, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you probably even did this when you got the news mm -hmm. that you got, but what do we do? We go, <gasps> that's right. We do. We do this automatically, unconsciously. Mm -hmm. Why do we do this? Well, we do this to try to ground ourselves because when we get bad news, we do tend to disappear. We're afraid. We're afraid of the part of self that is feeling that pain. So doing this unconsciously helps us to say, okay, stay grounded, stay breathe, here, stay breathe. home, breathe, breathe. Breathe. And for anybody Everything. that's audio only right now and not watching on video, I want you to know what we're doing is just how you place your hand over your other side of your heart, place your hand on your heart when you're doing the Pledge of Allegiance, but that's basically the motion. It is. And Cover you want to your... do it, you want to do it uh, firmly. And I always say tenderly, because mm -hmm. if you're needing to do this when you're hurting, then you want to be tender with yourself. So this is an act of self-compassion. I actually call this self-compassioning, <laughs> that it's a verb. A so verb, I like it, yeah. <laughs> it's a verb, it's a verb. And you can do it with one hand, you can do it with both hands. Mm -hmm. And they're really nice. You can have your eyes open or you can close your eyes or just lower them. It's really whatever is most comfortable. And the, the neatest thing with this is it, you can do it anywhere, at any time. You need no special equipment. No one even really needs to notice 
know that you're doing it. And yet it can help because, you know, you can put your hand here. No one's going to go, oh, what are you doing that for? You can take deep breaths. No one's going to be saying, oh, why are you breathing? You know, uh, you, it costs no money. <laughs> right. You know? So we call, I, I call this a beholding gesture. So it's holding our being. That's what we're doing. We're, we are holding our being. We are human beings. And we talk a lot about, you know, our brain. We talk a lot about our heart. I think we don't talk enough about our being. And we call it a soul injury. If, if I had my druthers to be perfectly accurate, I would probably call it a being injury. <laughs> that would never work with anybody. But that's really what it mm -hmm. is. It's a being injury that we're talking about when we start getting separated. And the sad thing is, is there is no language that I know of that really articulates the phenomena of becoming separated from your own sense of self. We, we don't have a language. Wow. That's, uh, that's just, you know, I'm a rhetoric that's major, so I like words and you're right. That is it. That is, in fact, I was searching for a word for even how, what I went through this weekend. And I finally decided that it was, I was shattering because I couldn't mm -hmm. think of a word, but it felt like shattering, which is that I couldn't just put the pieces back together. That would be far too simplistic. It was much more, I was much more disabled than that in a weird way. I, I, there was nothing to grab onto other than to just be, like you mm -hmm. just said, it's to just be. So you're right. We don't even have a language for this. And yet we it's have a term. at the core of our humanity. It is at the scattered core pieces of, who we are. of self. Say it again. Now we have a term that we use: scattered pieces of self. That, that it once and lawyer's daughter. If you see someone else that is in pain, and maybe you don't know them well enough, all you have to do is put your hand firmly on their back. You don't have to say anything. Do not pat. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, no, no. It's like in the military. I have your back. I am there for support. If it is a friend that you're you know, close to, you could just go like that. It's all right, Brett, Deborah. Breathe. Just breathe. So it's not just for you. It's how you could help another, even a stranger, just by applying that little bit of pressure, you acknowledge what they are going through. You're validating their suffering. I can imagine even with a child, like just a child. Oh, most definitely. Just yes. almost yes. gesture like, okay, breathe, catch, mm -hmm. you know, get yourself together. It's okay. You'll recover mm -hmm. you'll right there. Children are great with this. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had a case manager that is a pediatric case manager, and she was visiting a home of uh, someone that was in a domestic violence shelter, and the child was pulling the hair out of her doll, and her mom was very concerned about this, obviously. Well, this nurse taught her, taught this little girl, I think she was about eight to 10 years yeah, old, yeah. somewhere mm -hmm. in there, how to do the anchoring heart technique. <laughs> and um, the next week when the case manager followed up, not only was the child doing the anchoring heart technique, but she was no longer pulling out her own hair. And she was also doing the anchoring heart technique on her doll. On her baby. Oh, mm -hmm. child, children pick this up very easily. They really do. And the other thing that Marie's pointing out by approaching, you know, you can, you can approach the, the heart from the front or the back. So even mm -hmm. though it's on your back and, you know, I've got your back, it's still the energy over your heart mm -hmm. just from the opposite, opposite direction. And you do want to be careful. You know, I've been in many groups at veteran services of different kinds. You can appreciate where there's hundreds right. of veterans and they get triggered sometime 21 gun salute at a funeral and you, and you hear those guns going up. And, you know, mm -hmm. I may be standing next to a veteran. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so if, you know, they're triggered. And you, when, you, when you've got PTSD, you don't want anybody around mm -hmm. you. So to come in and be doing this when someone in an active trigger that you don't know, you want to be careful. But I have often taught them how to do it even in the moment. Mm -hmm. So I might say to them, you know, I wonder if you could just hold your, hold your heart and breathe. and breathe, you know, and, you know, I don't even know this person, mm -hmm. you know, just hold your heart. So you can teach it to them right in the moment oftentimes. And then, you know, um, 
later, I mean, sometimes I'll say after they get calmed down, okay, now close your eyes and just notice the sensations in your body. Because what you, they've kind of disappeared from their body, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get them grounded and back in their body. So don't have them close their eyes first because they don't know you. And, you know, that's the last thing. They're looking for danger. They're looking yeah. for all these things. But after you get them calmed down and then just say, okay, if, if you feel able, close your eyes mm -hmm. and just notice the sensations in your body. Come back. Come back. Come, come back, back to your body. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Come back that's home. Come stupid. back home to yourself. We even talk about reowning scattered pieces of self. So the way you do that is you have to acknowledge these pieces of self. You can't pretend like the pain's not there. You can't pretend like the trauma didn't happen. You can't make excuses for the person that molested you. Whatever it is, all of that minimizes and devalues this part of self that knows the truth. Mm -hmm. That knows the truth. That knows that it did happen. That knows that that person did intentionally mean to do that to you. Whatever it might be. Whatever the truth of it is. That's and then this, so important. That truth, you can run, you can hide, but the truth doesn't go away. Doesn't and that's, go away. that's, and that, that is probably the part that I think people resist the most. They want to try to recreate a reality that isn't true. And, and, mm -hmm. and now well, they're encouraged to do that. I mean, you look at any advertisements, you look at a lot, at a lot of treatment programs and that's what they're basically, that's often they don't realize the value of grieving, of acknowledging the loss. Look at all the losses that occur. And anytime you have a trauma, you don't have just one loss. You, you will have, you know, multiple, multiple, at least I'm telling you in the counseling that I've done with people, you'll have at least 20 losses around one trauma. And each mm -hmm. of those present a different facet. And each of those, there's like a part of self that's holding that truth. And you want to connect with that scattered piece of self. And sometimes uh, <laughs> I've, I've dealt with people that, you know, we, we do a lot with forgiveness because a lot about forgiveness in changing your relationship to, to the part of self that's experienced that trauma, it has to do with forgiveness. And people say, well, I've already forgiven him mm -hmm. or I've already forgiven her or I've already forgiven whatever. And first of all, I always, I go tell me, and especially if it's a big trauma, like a sexual assault. I mean, with mo sexual assault has so many layers. It's mm -hmm. not just a sexual act. It, there's so many layers of right. betrayal and violation to it. So if someone says, oh, that was a long time ago, and I, you know, oh, I, I'll say, I'll just stop. I'll say, tell me what you did. And if they say, oh, I just forgave them, then I know that that is false forgiveness that's actually a way of denial mm -hmm. that's a way of sweeping it under the carpet and saying oh i don't need to do the forgiveness work because you know i already did it and um uh, that's that can easily be a form of denial um on the other hand they'll tell me oh my gosh how hard it is oh and i had to do this and it took it's forgiveness is a process and the deeper the trauma is the more process oriented it is and then sometimes I, I remember uh, with a, a colleague of mine who had gone through a very awful divorce and her husband had done all sorts of things and she had worked really hard to get through the, um, uh, the bitterness really initially and then, you know, just moving on with her life. But at any rate, she'd done a great job. And then I said, well, you know, you still have a 10% residue she said, oh, Deborah, isn't 90% forgiving? 90, isn't that good enough? And I said, well, it's good. But, you know, it's that last 10% that's clutching your heart. That's the most intimate. That's going to, if you want to truly be liberated, if you want to truly be liberated, you got to go for the last 10%. I said, I'm not saying 90% isn't good. You should be patting yourself on the back. But that last 10% is the hardest. And it is the most liberating otherwise you're still clutching it tightly here even though it's just a little bit it can still have a stranglehold on you so she did the work and uh, she often tells her story in our in our um in some in our program mm -hmm. for example at, at the intensive she tells her program she tells her story about how she did that i feel like you just called me out Oh my God, I think it is that last 10% when I think I'm such a smarty pants, but I know 
Well, we should be proud of the 90%. We really should be proud of the 90%. Absolutely. Um, and we shouldn't stop there. We have to have the humility to say, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. The finish line is right there, but it's not quite there. Oh, it's the worst. And you're right. The last 10% is the worst. But I think you're right. Because the first thing I did was cancel the therapist because. Ugh. So, yeah. All right. You called me out. I got to own, <laughs> own my own stuff here as, uh, as I get free therapy here in, in the interview. But I, that, it's. It, I, everything you're saying makes so much sense to me. And mm -hmm. so let's talk about if people want to learn this process and I, and I can call up the website to show the, the price game, mm -hmm. but there's a training that you do. I don't know how often you do it, but I heard it's fantastic from people. It like is. Funded. So how, how <laughs> we're humble you? too. We're very <laughs> humble. <laughs> go Marie. Um, yeah. So tell me about the training and I'm going to go ahead and um, share the, 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 the webpage while you're talking. Okay. Well, um, we have traditionally been doing the training for uh, every six months. We've been doing it for four years. So mm -hmm. we've held eight leadership trainings before. And of course, this with COVID, the last one, uh, the last two have gotten canceled. And so we really didn't quite know what to do. We didn't expect it to go on so long, but we kept getting so many um, requests and almost demands to say, mm -hmm. do it virtually. And I was, cause when we do this training, mm -hmm. it's over four days and we do give a lot of information for the head. We tell a lot of stories. Um, about and touch the heart and more importantly we give people an experience mm -hmm. we give people an experience and to so I kept saying we can't do it virtually I mean we're all about giving people the experience <laughs> I know I do webinars I've been doing webinars for 20 years I can do information and I always get emails that say oh you touched my heart but that's the leadership institute is more than that or the intensive is more than that it, it's it goes down deeper so how do you do that virtually right. so we are doing our first one virtually we have come up with all uh, we have been relentless mm -hmm. our team has been relentless in devising ways that we can bridge that virtual gap so for example participants are going to get in the mail <sighs> In the mail before it starts, two weeks before it starts, they're going to get in the mail what we call a behold box. Hold okay. your be with all the self help tools inside. That's going to arrive on their doorstep. That and then we have uh, we we do a lot with ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So we are going to virtually be implementing this behold box and utilizing it within ceremonies in addition to the traditional presentations and and those kinds of things so right. it really is well designed to give people an experience of themselves and yes they will be doing some inner work uh, as far as unmourned loss and hurt and unforgiven guilt and shame so that they can experience their own personal healing. Because, you know, I, I remember the uh, chaplain that I worked with for years on our hospice unit, he would always say, it's unethical to ask our patients to do what we ourselves are unwilling to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that you made it ethical too, because that, I know, is. I mean, that really ties it to the core, right? Yeah, how dare you yeah. do do as I say but not as I do no I'm going to do it too and so a quick question for you because in looking at the training um, and, and for folks that are only listening right now you just go to the opuspeace.org site in the upper right there's something called leadership training um, I, the only thing I can't see in here is the dates of when it is. It must be on here somewhere, but I could. Oh, there we go. Um, 26th through 29th of October. So it's at the end. You'll be done before Halloween. So it's the 26th <laughs> to 29th. And the pricing, in my humble opinion, is is extremely reasonable. If we, if I'm going to post this podcast immediately, but if you are available, if you register before October 1st, it's $875. But actually talked with the Opus Peace folks. And if you come to the Lawyer's Daughter page on 
Facebook, you can find some others and create your own group where then you can get decent di lower discounts. So if mm -hmm. three or four of you band together, first of all, I'm going to know who you are. So I'm going to help use you to help me help others, but also it allow you to get a, a discount and the pricing. So that's a group discount. So it's, it's incredibly for anybody who's done any of this kind of work, this is incredibly reasonable pricing, mm -hmm. but I also believe it will be life changing. And so I, I super encourage anyone listening who's thought about this, who's ready to move on to the next step of your healing and ready to start to pay it forward. It, you know, something like Chris, what Chris Pedretti and I are doing, she's another survivor from this, but Chris and I have been working hard on trying to pay it forward. This is the kind of training that I myself need to do because, and I'm a little bit afraid to <laughs> tell you the truth because it does That's mean honesty. my own stuff, but I actually think it could be quite moving. So I'm going to start a group. If people want to register with me, I'll start a group on my own uh, Lawyer's Daughter Facebook page. If you want to go in in a group with me and we can attend this training together and support each other through the training and any um, late night conversations that need to happen or anything else, because I guarantee it sounds like this, especially since we're going to do it remote, we're going to need to come up with ways to support each other um, as we move through it. So I'm absolutely thrilled to do that as well, because I think it could be incredibly powerful for anyone listening to uh -huh. this podcast. Well, lawyer's daughter, Deborah did her masterpiece, her thesis, uh, her master's degree thesis on ceremonies and symbols. So these ceremonies, they're just not pomp and circumstance. There is a ritual behind them that is healing, that it makes you, it changes you. So you're just not going to see something. You're going to experience something that will change you. So that's the plus by having such an expert do this. <laughs> you know, uh, um, the woman that introduced me to you, the, the yes. guest that I had about grief, is such a remarkable woman. Um, I'm going to actually make sure she's signed up as well if I can. But um, I already have seen the change you've manifested as she tells her story. So I, I understand the power of Opus Peace. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, you know, I can't, your mission starting with the soldiers is beyond, I'm so grateful for that. I, I don't know how to express it, but I, I have such gratitude for the work that you have done with your lives and the difference that you've made, but the fact you were able to turn it into something that all of us could learn from and participate in, that's my dream. I, I would hope to be able to do something similar. Like it's so powerful to me and I, I couldn't be more grateful for the work that you've done and that you're continuing to do and sharing with everybody. I mean, just thank you from Wait. the bottom of my heart. You are so welcome. You know, what's coming to my mind, you can appreciate as hospice nurses mm -hmm. that we saw a lot of suffering, not mm -hmm. just as people were dying, um, but certainly their family members that are at bedside and extended. Um, but also, as I said, people often do life review and they'll reach back in their back and in their past and bring forward the traumas and the regrets and all of that. And so we have seen obviously a lot of suffering and so we don't we don't want to waste that suffering right you know how do you redeem suffering you don't you know one of our our premises is don't waste your suffering get the lesson get the lesson and so partially you know this is really what what i see as your mission mm -hmm. in helping others and reaching out is you are forming communities common unity that encourages people to listen to each other to tell their stories to um, be able to redeem the suffering so it is not wasted to share the lesson to be able to share this is how we do it and i can tell you in almost everybody's story there comes that decision point just like you made this mm -hmm. past weekend where you say okay i've got to quit running from this i've got to quit pretending i've got to quit going through the motion and i'm going to stop and get real this happened to me and learn how to connect with that part of myself instead of pretend or be ashamed of it even worse and so many things you know people minimize because it happened in childhood like sexual mm. assault in childhood oh well that was 20 years ago 30 years ago 50 years ago six. but you know as a child the violation and the identity problems it causes you know there's the soul injury that that occurs because 
we lose our sense of self because of what that other person did. They stole that from, you'll hear people, sexual um, survivors mm -hmm. mention that all the time. They stole that from me. So this has great relevance for uh, people. I, I'm just always, I guess I, I shouldn't be because I've heard so many people's stories. We've had a couple hundred people come through our training, mm -hmm. but it is amazing how many people have experienced sexual violence. Mm -hmm. I feel like I need a worry and, stone and men says, and men also. Oh and yeah. Well, and that's why I wanted like a worry stone that says, don't waste your suffering. Like yes. just that thing that you touch every once in a while and remember, don't waste the suffering. Cause that is, that's the other side of it, right? That's, that's the, the hope. hope. That's the hope. That's yeah. the hope. You see, you know, Marie talked about my master's mm -hmm. degree. What I did is I, I took, you know, you have to have a, a, a variable and I, so I, I, did the relationship of rituals and ceremonies to hope. If you do a ceremony, how can that help your hopefulness for your future? Mm -hmm. And so at any rate, um, Oh my God, that's my Ruth Bader Ginsburg seven days of Sherpa. It's my there. own ritual and ceremony to remember that's somebody right. wonderful. Oh my Very God. Good. See, there's so much that we know we are enough. <laughs> we are, and you do things like anchor your heart. You did this, you, you went into your own cocoon to come out differently, and you do it unknowing. Yeah. You know what your body needs, and you just did it instinctively. And uh, that's beautiful. I knew I would love this interview. I knew it. I knew it did too. <laughs> I, knew it. I knew it. It from the minute I found out about your organization. Uh, ladies, thank you so much for today. Thank I, you. I just I'm going to yes. get this out way early because I'm so excited about this, and I'm going to get the word out. And there will be some sort of tribe of us. I'm not sure who it'll be or how it'll happen, but I'm bringing a tribe. So. Um, I cannot wait for this training, even though it's going to be hard. And I, I so it will be liberate. It will also be liberating. That's right. That's right. There is there. Yeah. By the fourth day, you're going to be liberated. I'm. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I will not waste my suffering. I thank Very you good. so so much. And thank um, you, lawyer's daughter. I appreciate it so, so much. I thank you very much, ladies, and I look forward thank to you. seeing you at the end of October. Yeah. All right. Bless you, bless you, bless, bless you. you. Bye, you. everybody. Au revoir.